Okay, it's nine o'clock. You can get you guys can get started whenever you're ready. Do you want to do the introduction first before you pull up the screen? Uh, yeah. Uh, is, is Dr. Omugo going to do the introduction or should I just go ahead and dive in? I could do it and probably just introduce you and then you can start. All right. That's okay. Good afternoon, everybody, or uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. You're welcome to our global Ubuntu dialogue today. And this is going to be a very different one today. We have our own very own uh, Dr. Paul E. Selin, Oga of Humanities, and he is going to be delivering his first lecture today. I'm excited because <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it. And it's on what's the topic of your course again collective yeah collective action uh we'll deal uh, with our early pan-african movements fantastic yeah. so i'll hand over to dr easterling now and he would start and if you're joining us today for the first time ebeniza i know you already know about us but just to inform you that we have all of our social media platforms and you can follow us at osiri africa on instagram on youtube on LinkedIn and on Facebook. So over to you, Dr. Paul Easterling. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugo. Uh, all right. Um, just uh, as way by way of introduction, this is the uh, module one for the collective action and organizing for change and African liberation. Uh, this is our uh, week one module, and we will be discuss uh, discussing um, Pan African movements and Pan African thought. Uh, in antiquity and uh, what that means and uh, how do we understand uh, the movement of, um, of Pan-Africanism in, uh, in our world. <clears throat> um, all right, just by way of uh, further introduction, um, when I was approached by this, uh, for this class, I was excited because I've always wanted to uh, teach a class that uh, dealt with uh, the movement of African people, you know, over the millennia and not just centered on, you know, what happened, you know, when we dealt with uh, Europeans uh, during uh, the time when they were uh, able to leave their continent, um, you know, colonialism and slavery and so forth. So this course, I'm um, very excited to uh, deliver and I uh, hope everybody uh, enjoys it. All right. Yes, please. <clears throat> All right, let me just go there. All right, so first, by way of just definitions, so we know, you know, what uh, um, nomenclature we'll use uh, moving forward. Um, when we talk about uh, Pan African nationalism or Pan Africanism, um, we have two types. Uh, one is continental, that is based uh, ma uh, mainly on the continent and its, you know, outlying islands. Um, the start and practice directed towards the liberation and unity of the African continent. And this definition is coming from uh, Maulana Karanga's uh, uh, intro to Black Studies text. And then he says the second uh, type of Pan-African uh, nationalism is a uh, global and it's thought and practice directed toward the liberation, unity, and mutual support of African people throughout the world. Now, uh, this just connects uh, the African continent to the diaspora. So who, so this is for those Africans living uh, in the United States, uh, in, the Bra in Brazil, which actually has uh, the largest population of Africans outside of Africa, or uh, is in Brazil. All the um, uh, Africans in, in uh, Canada and the Caribbean and the UK, that's, that's the global context of uh, Pan-Africanism. And I just want to say to Ebenezer, if you have any questions, you can... Uh, you can jump in, just, you know, raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you best I can. All right. Um, so uh, moving forward, um, so what is this idea of, of Black nationalism? And uh, Karenga, again, uh, from the intro to Black Studies text says, it's the social thought and practice centered in the concept and conviction that African Americans are a distinct people with a distinct personality and they have the right and responsibility to unite 
in order to gain the structural capacity to find, defend, and develop their own interests. All right, now this is a very spe um, specific type of uh, uh, ideology because it's, it's based on um, African Americans and you know their struggle, their particular struggle that, that we've had uh, uh, in this country. So black nationalism might not necessarily uh, translate well in a continental African sense because uh, most people there are, are uh, already black. So it takes on a different tone and texture once uh, this ideology uh, you know, spreads throughout the world. And I wanted to uh, put that out there uh, to provide different context of the diversity of African thought you know, when it comes to how we function as a collective of both, uh, you know, in a global context and a more specific context where we're talking about uh, the United States or Brazil or uh, somewhere on the continent. Um, again, this uh, definition is region specific and does not necessarily include the interests of African people and other nations. And that's uh, what I was just saying. Uh, the definition is also based on racial consciousness, not cultural consciousness. And that is extremely important point that to understand yourself from a quote unquote black point of view, whether we're, uh, uh, as opposed to an African point of view, kind of reduces uh, the person to uh, their, their color identity rather than their cultural identity. And um, as we move along uh, in this course, and um, with Osiri University, uh, cultural uh, consciousness is, is, I think, our, our primary objective rather than uh, uh, simply a racial consciousness. consciousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, John uh, Henry Clark uh, speaks to this point. He says, it's time for Black people to stop playing the separation game of geography, of where the slave ship put us down. We must instead concentrate on where the slave ship picked us up. And again, this is specifically speaking to uh, those Africans in uh, the diaspora who have, may have a, a, a more of a color consciousness or even a nationalistic consciousness, you know, being if you're Jamaican or Dominican or Brazilian and uh, based it more on the cultural context, all right? <clears throat> and he argues that when we speak about black people, wherever they are in the world, uh, their name must reflect three things, land, history, and culture. And again, um, he argues that, you know, black people, when you, black people call themselves black, it tells people what you look like, but it doesn't necessarily tell you who you are. All right. And again, we want to focus away from, you know, just the surface uh, uh, understanding of what it means to be African to a more cultural context. All right. Uh, just to, you know, put it in context, you know, I'm light skinned. So anyone in the world, uh, I could be seen as, you know, brown skin. I can easily blend into a number of different contexts just based on skin color. But my cultural consciousness is African. And, and that's, that's the point that John Henry Clark was trying to get to, um, that we need to focus on land history and culture rather than the pure aesthetics of, of our uh, skin color. You have any questions uh, so far, Mr. Ebenezer? You're on mute. Okay. You good? Excellent um, intro, intro to that. All right, all right. I just want to make sure you see it. Excuse me? I have some contribution from my readings, um, um, which is other than the material you provided to, to, to add, and I guess you may be interested. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll uh, keep moving along, and then uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about your questions as we move along. Thank you. All right, all right. Uh, so just wanted to give a few more understandings of uh, what uh, Pan-Africanism means. Um, uh, Dr. E.B. Du Bois, uh, excuse me, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois uh, argued that uh, the Pan-African movement 
is an aid to the promotion of national self-determination among Africans under African leadership and for the benefit of Africans themselves. Africans themselves. And I think this argument comes out of his participation in, in developing the African Union uh, back in the early uh, um, uh, 20th century. So we're speaking from a very nationalistic uh, point of view. Um, and again, you know, it's, there's no uh, judgment either way. I'm just giving you a different uh, context of how we understand Pan-African, Pan-Africanism and Pan-African nationalism. Uh, next one, uh, 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 Peter Esadike es argues that Pan-Africanism is a political cult and cultural phenomenon with regards to Africa, Africans, and their descendants at, uh, abroad as a unit. And again, this is more a, of a, um, a global Pan-African uh, perspective that SDK provides. Um, again, to uh, Dr. Jen ha John Henry Clark, who argues that Pan-Africanism is about the restoration of African people to their proper place in world history, to facilitate and bring about the ingathering of African people throughout the world and to restore what slavery, slavery and colonialism took away, all right? Now, John Henry Clark, being a historian, is, is very focused on, you know, rebuilding this, this history of African people and, and so we can be at the table of, of, of respect when we speak about how the world is and how we are going to be uh, moving forward. And, uh, Dr. Emerson argues that the sense that all Africans have a sp spiritual affinity with each other and that having suffered together in the past slavery, colonialism, they must march together into a new and brighter future. In its fullest realization, it would involve the creation of an African Leviathan in the form of a political organization and associated association of states. Um, it uh, might also involve an almost infinite variety of regional groupings and collaborative arrangements which are partial, uh, partial embodiments of the counter-embracing unity, which is the dream of uh, true Pan-African, uh, true, uh, the true Pan-Africa, all right? And he's speaking more on, you know, developing a, a, a concrete um, um, uh, coalition of African people on the continent and throughout the world, all right? <clears throat> Moving forward. So the uh, text that I will focus on today, and this is the text that I sent to uh, the class, um, is, comes from uh, Kwame Nantu, uh, Nantambu. Um, it's Pan-African, uh, Pan-Africanism versus Pan-African nationalism, an Afrocentric uh, analysis. And I wanted to provide, because uh, I, I like the way he um, breaks down uh, the different historical uh, uh, facets of Pan-Africanism and attempts to, you know, uh, give the long view of uh, what Pan-Africanism may mean. So he argues that uh, Pan-African nationalism, Pan nationalism is the nationalistic unified struggle resistance of African people against all forms of foreign aggression and invasion in the fight or nationhood, uh, uh, fight, nationhood or nation building. The primary goal of Pan-African nationalism is the total liberation and unification of all African people under African com uh, communalism. Uh, Pan-African nationalism seeks to achieve African nationhood and nationality, human perfectibility based on several cardinal principles, uh, principles slash virtues of Mayat. Uh, and we talked about Mayat a little bit yesterday with uh, my other class and that Maya is a self-reliance, uh, self-determination, um, self-incarceration versus of Maya, excuse me. Self-reliance, self-determination, uh, the creation of Pan-African national solidarity, solidarity and the confraternity of, among all African people on the continent and in the diaspora. A cooperative, humanistic, and communal value system, spirituality, and traditional extended family uh, um, modus uh, vivendi and polycentrism. All right, so he's trying to give a, a large definition of what it means to be Pan-African and, and move towards a sense of Pan-African nationalism. And it is a large undertaking, right? We're talking about 
are working to align um, over a billion people spread and spread throughout the globe. All right. So the idea of Pan-Africanism is a large and extremely daunting idea. But I argue as we move along that this idea is worth uh, fighting for. Uh, moving forward, let me get a little, a little drink. Excuse me. Uh, our author, Kwame Nantambu, also argues that a Pan-African identity should not involve having to define ourselves against any other branch of humanity. Uh, humanity all right? Uh, we don't, we're not Pan-African because, you know, we're not European, right? We have our own identity. We have our own place on this planet, and we have the right to uh, celebrate and uh, uh, develop uh, that that identity uh, towards the future, right? We don't have to use it as something to keep other people down. Uh, he argues that Pan-African identity first began with the efforts towards internal development and nation building. So to give context to this, he's arguing that when African people started to develop themselves in the Nile Valley, for instance, and started to develop uh, uh, kingdoms and empires and, and developed writing and technology. These are the things, these are the early uh, um, elements of Pan-Africanism, the early elements of Pan-Africanism. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition, uh, he argues African people have fought against foreign invasion and encroachment for centuries and have worked internally to develop their own and protect their own interests. Um, he argues that the long view of Pan-African unity moves us away from defining our African identity against European non-African identity. Rather, Pan-African identity is to be divine on a cultural identity, which is based on collective effort of, Af of Africans working to develop their own interests. And again, he's just saying that we are African people not because we're not European, but because we are working to develop our own interests, all right? is to, to remove a need for uh, an antagonist. So we are able to develop ourselves based on our own interests rather than based on the idea that we're just not them, right? And I think that's a very important part that we don't need to be ourselves because we're not them. We are ourselves because of who we are already. <clears throat> and he argues the short view of Pan-African unity is centered on those efforts of African people who resist white supremacy and European hegemony. Now, the short view is very uh, important to this uh, to this idea of what Pan-Africanism is, but he just does not want to be reliant on Pan-Africanism being um, meshed against or, 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 or balanced against um, what is white or what is European. All right, so he breaks down uh, the stages of Pan-African development going back to uh, ancient Egypt, which we will, we will refer to as Kemet uh, in this course. And he moves it forward step by step uh, based on uh, this, this idea. And again, that's, this is why I wanted to uh, share this article and discuss it because I like the fact that he takes the long view of Pan-Africanism Pan rather than focusing on the last few centuries, all right? Just, just to give us greater context of who we are, all right? So he argues the first period of unification was characterized by resistance against foreign invasion and the dynastic governance slash nation building of the BC uh, or BCE with before common era uh, in ancient Egypt, all right? Now this includes knowledge development, uh, writing with an eye towards the future, and uh, art and architecture. And just to further tease out these points. So Kemet um, is, is one of the foundations of, of human culture throughout the world. Well, when you talk about, you know, where you know, things, science and writing, and architecture first developed, we're talking about early Kemet, all right? During, uh, particularly during the dynastic periods. So 
during this time, um, African people or or or, or the uh, Egyptians, the uh, Kemetic uh, people, Kemetians, we'll call them. Um, they they wrote with an eye towards the future. They wrote in stone, right? They didn't write on paper. They did write on paper, but they didn't only write on paper. They had the means to write on other things. And I believe that that this might have been uh, a for a reason, that if we write something in stone, it's, it's difficult to destroy, right? Whether it's if we write something in paper, you know, a good fire will, will take care of that. And that destroys, you know, all history, right? If, if uh, ancient Egyptians or ancient uh, 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 commissions only wrote on paper, we would know nothing about them, right? Which means that somebody else could easily take credit for what they did, right? But they wrote in stone, they carved in stone, uh, uh, and you know, they 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 wrote, um, they carved their faces on stone. So generations later. We can, uh, we can look at who these people were, right? So we don't have to be reliant on uh, Hollywood renditions of, of who the ancient uh, commissions were. We can look back at the stones themselves and say, oh, these, these are the people. This is what they look like. We can see their facial features. We can, uh, in those instances when they use color, we can see the color, right? And this is an important point because it, you know, writing in stone it ensures that later generations will be able to uh, to see it, and um, you know, in the arch in architecture, we can see the dynamic things they did with it. So this this first uh, this first period is is very important, particularly uh, for us now uh, as African people, as we've been told you know time and time again that uh, African people have no history. Well, we can stop and say, well, no, that's not true because look at Kemet. And it's, and it's not just Kemet. We can look at Nubia. We can look at Kush. We can look at Moreau. Uh, we can look at a number of civilizations that go all the way uh, uh, from the base of the Nile, uh, the uh, mouth of the Nile, uh, down to uh, the Great Lake region where it starts. Right? It's a fourth, that's, a, that's called the Nile Valley. That's a 4,000 mile area of culture um, that has been uh, uh, preserved. There's so a lot of it has been preserved. All right. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the second period, uh, Nantambu argues that the second period of Pan-African development was characterized by the continued resistance against foreign invasion in ancient Kemet to the dawn uh, of the AD era, era and beyond. Uh, the uh, uh, the coter uh, co uh, co contemporaneous excuse me uh, with the development of uh, re religion, culture, civilization, educational systems, nationhood governance, and the social norms and customs by Africans or Moors under uh, General uh, Jabril Tariq Iraq of Gibraltar uh, uh, during the um, occupation of, of Spain uh, from 711 to uh, 1485. So. What he's speaking about is at the end of the dynastic period of ancient Kemet and the rise of Greece and the rise of Rome, you see a decline in um, you know Egyptian culture. Um, um, the the civilization is old; it's it's two thousand old over two thousand years old by this time. So it's it's declining; it's tired, and other civilizations are starting to rise up. Um, as is you know just the way history happens. So the Greeks rise up and then the Romans rise up. And at this era, at this time, um, around the time, you know, we get the changing from the, um, before the common era to the common era, uh, the, um, the civilization is, is, is dying out. But, you know, they were fighting their way out. They weren't just, you know, laying down, uh, you know, they, they fought. And um, from here, we give a, a, a number of migrations that spread throughout Africa from ancient Kemet. As uh, Kemet is declining, uh, some of the inhabitants of ancient Kemet start to leave and, and go to the Western Africa and Southern Africa, you know, in order to preserve their culture and, you know, in order, you know, to just, just move on. You know, the civilization is declining, so we move on. Um, 
uh, and this this took place until about a four or five hundred uh, um, in the common era. So Egypt really does not fall completely until almost the Muslim era, uh, in, in the common era, in the common era. Now, when this comes about, we have the uh, rise of uh, the Moors, who are um, um, a nation of African people uh, um, centered in mainly in Northern Africa, nor Northwest Africa, who uh, um, occupied Southern Europe for a number of centuries, from 711 to 1485. So you have about seven centuries where uh, uh, Northwest Africa and Southern uh, 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 southwestern uh, Europe is dominated uh, uh, by uh, African people. And when I say dominated, I do not mean that, um, you know, there was uh, um, severe oppression or uh, slavery. There was uh, a number of uh, dynamic things that the Moors brought to uh, Europe, uh, culture and art and, and uh, uh, a sense of civilization. So uh, um, there was a lot of dynamic things that were happening with the Moorish occupation of Spain, and uh, this is a, um, an important era as we connect the dots from the ancient world to uh, to the new world, uh, in terms of you know uh, of uh, African civilization. And, and during this second period as well, we have uh, the development of of large empires in Western Africa. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Kingdom of Ghana uh, before. We have Ghana, uh, the, uh, the nation state that we know now. We have the, um, the empire of Ghana. And then um, uh, again, before uh, we have the nation state, uh, the modern era nation state Mali, we have the empire, uh, the Malian empire of, um, uh, of uh, medieval Africa. And as well, we have the empire of Songhai. And these are uh, three very large, um, um, empires that they rose and fell. So Ghana rose and fell, up rose Mali. Mali rose and fell and up rose Songhai. And um, during this period as well, you have uh, um, uh, cultural development, uh, uh, artistic development, agricultural development, intellectual development. One of the largest um, uh, libraries in the world during this time, uh, during uh, Mali's uh, uh, reign, was uh, the um, the library at Timbuktu, one of the largest libraries uh, on the planet at the time. Uh, and again, this speaks to the intellectual development that was uh, a, a critical part of of Africa's growth uh, from the ancient world to the new world. All right, so. Again, uh, destroying any uh, belief that African people do did not have culture and did not have civilization, uh, as we are we are seeing that this has been the case for uh, five thousand years, and it, it continues to uh, grow. All right, go to the third period. Now, this third period of uh, Pan African development comes uh, um, during the age of colonialism. So third period from the, from the 15th to the 19th century was a period of revolutionary Pan-African nationalism that was characterized by physical resistance against being captured as slaves on the continent. And there were a number of, 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 of wars and, and revolts that were fought before we even get to, to the slave ships, all right? So African people have never been passive in, in this oppressive state that we are uh, seem to be trapped in now. We've never been passive in it. So from the beginning, there were, there were fight, uh, fights and wars and skirmishes and battles against the, the process of enslavement. And then we have slave revolts that uh, happen all over the Americas. There's uh, hundreds of them. And that's actually one of the, uh, my interests that I've been studying uh, for a number of years, the, um, the different slave revolts that happened uh, throughout the Caribbean, South America, all over the United States. <clears throat> um, uh, just a couple, uh, one of the names, Nat Turner led a uh, slave rebellion um, in, the, uh, in uh, the, uh, Virginia, I believe it was Virginia. Uh, Samuel Sharp, I believe Samuel Sharp was in uh, uh, Jamaica. Um, Paul Cuffe, he was a, um, 
he he uh, developed the um, early uh, African American or early African uh, masonry. Uh, Dean Marvici had a uh, revolt in Virginia as well. Um, you have Toussaint uh, Leoverture who uh, uh, liberated uh, Haiti. Um, um, so it's a, uh, excuse me. And the I the uh, and then we have the um, intellectual development that came along with this. So not only do you have a number of names that were physically fighting against uh, um, um, European oppression, European hegemony, we have uh, a number of personalities who are, who are fighting uh, uh, um, um, uh, academically or, as, or intellectually, that is, right? So some of the intellectual uh, uh, champions are uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, uh, Martin Delaney, uh, Alexander Crummel, that's a, a typo. It's a Crummel spelled with a C. Uh, Henry Highland Garnett, uh, David Walker, um, Ed, Edward Wilmot Blyden, and, and there's a number of other names. I, you know, just didn't want to bog down the uh, text uh, with a number of names, with too many names. Um, and then we also get have wars that are going on on the African continent. So this is not just happening in the diaspora. It is definitely happening in the diaspora and Haiti and the up uprisings of Jamaica. Uh, but we also have Africans continuing to fight and push for their own interests and their own survival uh, uh, on the continent. The Anugo Wars, the Ashanti Wars, and the Zulu Wars are just a few examples. Just a few examples of the many, many uh, wars, skirmishes, battles that were fought to uh, 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 fight against um, European hegemony and, and to, to work to develop uh, African uh, interests in a, a global context. All right. It's moving along. Um, oh, Dr. Yes. yes, yes. Would it be okay if we, if we take a pause, if you don't mind, uh, to your indulgence, uh, to sort of unpack some of the things you've already laid out. I think sure. you've yes. given us so much to think about uh, before we, we go into a yes. intellectual overload here. Um, <laughs> I am, you know, initially, in fact, on your very first slide, Ebeniza has some questions and some contributions based on your uh, readings that uh, you assigned. So, I mean, I'll, I think I will I'll stand to really gain from what he wants to share with that regards, guys, and then maybe we could piggyback to uh, to your slides. Is definitely. That okay? we, we, yes. Oh, right. oh, yes. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And Ebenezer, if you want to say so, just raise your hand. I'll stop at any point. Yes. So, yes. Ebenezer, Ebenezer, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Prof and Doc. Um, the study or the readings quite interesting because prior to my readings, I've always thought that the struggle for for independence, which is from the colonial um, um, dictatorship era, began quite recently. Because my our readings of, in our literature over here, um, uh, uh, you know, suggest so. Um, some of the things I chanced on or I have known. I thought from a Ghana's perspective, we gained our colonial independence um, from uh, the British, which began prior to 1957. But I chanced on some readings um, which uh, led, uh, got me excited because of the work um, Kwame Natambo had done. And he's categorized them into eras or periods. And, and it's amazing. For example, we um, knew about 1958, some um, efforts by Kwame Nkrumah to um, kind of put all the other nations which were not liberated together. For right. example, we had um, what, what he, a, a, a speech he made that the independence of Ghana, um, of Africa, would not be achieved if other states, even though Ghana had, um, were, were, um, were still under colonial bondage. So he made efforts with meetings, several meetings, um, some of which I chanced on and, and I read. And it's exciting to know that it predates 
way right. back as, as the, the Kwame uh, Natambo had had um, you know postulates. Yeah. And and this is what I would just want to, if time permits, I could share with you some of yeah. those um, uh, things I, I got. Right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's that's very important uh, what you're bringing up because Kwame and Kruma um, had had a, a vision and yeah. uh, he understood that if it can't be just Ghana getting liberation because yeah. it's a small area on a large continent and we're yeah. literally surrounded by the enemy. So that's why he had the forethought to, to go out and be like, okay, we're going to do this in Ghana and we may yeah. be the first, but you guys need to get your stuff together too. Because after sure. we do it, these Europeans, they might come back harder for us. And yeah. instead of allowing Ghana to be recolonized or re-enslaved, um, you know, if there's a, a pattern of or, and a trend towards decolonization, Europeans would be less apt to fight against it because it would, it would cost them in lives, it would cost them in the money, and it would cost them in time. So Kwame Nkrumah's uh, vision was is just spectacular. I love Kwame Nkrumah because he understood if, if this is not done collectively, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not going to get done. It's, it's, or it's going to get done and then we might fall back even further. Beautiful. I mean, for me, I think what when you were sharing about the movements and periods, what I'm getting from it is that the Pan-African movement have movements have been about a quest and thirst for knowledge. I mean, that is that is what I'm. I'm I was okay. I was, I was a knowledge and freedom, both yeah. of them. That is really. And so it behooves us as African people to wake up every day and spend every moment of our lives on this intellectual quest for knowledge and this quest for freedom. That is what Pan-Africanism is all about, based on this, based on the little that I've heard. I mean, you, you sort of couch it in historical terms. You went from Kemet, and you right. talked about the, uh, the Africans in Europe, the, the Moors, and then back to the continent. In each of those periods, what I'm seeing is a people who are interested in gaining wisdom and in liberating themselves. Sure. Yes. And so, you know, yeah. when I, when I uh, talk to Africans and I always ask folks, what are you doing for your intellectual well-being, what are you doing to learn more? I mean, so, I mean so it's not just enough that, um, you know, you want to make, make ends meet, right? Or you could have a job. That's fine. That's all good and dandy. But to be a true Pan-African, you have to engage your mind. And for me, I, it's so refreshing yeah. that I'm here on, on the, in, this, in this classroom right now with Ebenezer. Mr. Ebenezer, are you, are you again, are you in Uganda or in Ghana? I know you are Ghanaian, but where are you? I'm in Ghana, Accra. Okay, okay you're in Accra. Isn't it beautiful we're on this platform? In Accra, Ghana. In, and then we have Ebenezer in Accra, Ghana right now. Yeah. The Black and Star. then we have yes. Dr. Paul Isterling, who is on the East Coast sure. of the U.S., an African-American, teaching an African about Pan-Africanism. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> and and Ebenezer, Ebenezer is excited. Uh, so I, I, I am, ex- I am ex- uh, inspired by the reading. I am engaged by the reading. And you just introduced him to a world that he wasn't aware of uh, yeah. initially. So I, I really thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul Easterling, for yeah. engaging Ebenezer as a student on the yeah. very first uh, the week of, of class. And yeah. he was so eager to, uh, to, to contribute. And yeah. I, I think uh, somebody raised their hand, but uh, Dr. Paul, please don't let us derail you, but I just wanted to make sure that we are listening to uh, uh, the student, to Ebenezer, and then perhaps you can, you can go ahead and continue with your, uh, with your slides. Yeah, I, um, and the, you know, what, what we're talking about is actually feeding right into uh, um, the next part. And again, uh, um, Kwame Nkrumah is, is extremely dynamic, and we go uh, into that further. Um, yeah. 
And so this, this brings us to the fourth period. Um, and this is the period in the early uh, 20th century. And this is the critical period that we're just, we just uh, started talking up. So this uh, period was characterized by the intellectual, geopolitical, scientific, and cultural Pan-African nationalism of the 20th, first, uh, or 20th century, exemplified by W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Henry Sylvester Williams, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Maurice Bishop, George Padmore, uh, Marcus Garvey, Michael Max, uh, the, and the list goes on, right? So we can see the list. Uh, I'll let you uh, I'll read the list for yourself, but I wanted to to further uh, um, uh, implore about the uh, importance of this period. All right, so let's take Kwame Nkrumah. All right, Kwame Nkrumah, when he studied when he came to the United States and studied, he went to Lincoln University. Now, why is that special? Because Lincoln University is an HBCU, a historically black college slash university in the United States. So he came here to the United States and went to where he saw his people, right? He came here and he joined a, 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 a fraternity, a black fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma. So his mindset when he got to the States was to unite with other black people in any way he could, right? He, he went to a black university. He joined a black fraternity, right? He conversed and, and talked with, with the boys and, and, and went to lectures. And, you know, he was involved in the, in the intelligentsia of Pan-Africanism in the United States. Then he went back to Ghana. Then he went back to Ghana. And he started to develop this idea of Ghana as a nation state, all right? We're not talking about Ghana, the empire of medieval Africa. We're talking about Ghana, the nation state of the 20th century. And he started to develop this, this idea of, of, the, of the nation state. And he chose uh, for the symbol of that nation state as it developed as, as the Black Star. Now, what is the Black Star? The Black Star is the symbol of Marcus Garvey's Pan-African movement, who was from Jamaica. He developed a Black Star ship line, which uh, he meant to be, he meant for uh, the Black Star ship line to start shipping African people back to the continent from the new world, all right? And this is the symbol, the symbol that was developed by a Jamaican who went to Harlem to develop his organization, the uh, UNIA, he took the symbol of the Black Star and took that as, as the, what will be on the flag in Ghana. Now, that is Pan-African movement, right? A Jama uh, 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 ideas in Jamaica and ideas in the United States and this intellectual development in Ghana. And all this comes together to help to develop uh, uh, the, the first nation state, uh, the first uh, post-colonial nation state in Africa. Now, that to me is, is a, a shining, beautifully shining example of of Pan-African unity, right? It developed by the genius uh, of Kwame Nkrumah, working with other African people, both historical and, 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 and what, who he dealt with in his present with a clear vision for the future. That, that to me is the, this fourth period is one of my favorite periods in, in this you know, development of, of, of Pan-Africanism. And it well, as well during this time to give it, you know, to move on from the intellectual point of view to the more uh, physical, uh, um, there were anti-colonial movements happening all over the continent at this time. People physically fighting, engaging in wars to liberate themselves from the, from the uh, uh, oppression of Europeans, all right? Nigeria, Kenya, the, the, uh, the Mama of Kenya, the, the the struggles in, in South Africa and all over the continent, you see this, this strong push, this physical as well as intellectual push against uh, a colonialism, against oppression, against European hegemony. And furthermore, at this point, I, ha I have to bring up the work of Dr. Sheikh Anthony Giop because Sheikh Anthony Giop uh, of, of Senegal developed a way to look into the past to towards Kemet, towards ancient Egypt in particular, to, for us to understand that these people are African. He developed tests uh, to measure uh, uh, the, um, the amount of melanin in the mummified bodies, 
right? Which again might speak to why uh, the ancient Kemetic uh, Hermitians mummified bodies in the first place to prefer, to preserve what 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 might be uh, destroyed in the future, right? They had a clear vision for the future. So Sheikh Atijiyop he worked to develop to develop our understanding that ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet were African people. So if, if we are capable of doing this, right, in, in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, we can do anything. And that's the importance of, uh, of, of the intellectual development of Sheikh Antijiop. We are sitting here, all of us, kind of children of, intellectual children of Sheikh Antijiop and, and the, the powerful work that he did uh, in, in working against uh, uh, European colonial thought and European uh, um, intellectual hegemony. And we'll uh, move on. That's the fourth period. Now, uh, the fifth period, I developed for myself. So this moves beyond what uh, uh, Dr. Nantambu argues in his text. And I push it a little bit further because I, I, I believe that we're, we're in the midst of another renaissance going on. Um, and this I argue, is the late 20th century and the early uh, 21st century. Right now, what's going on? Pan-African unity is divine, defined by the continued development of culture and knowledge, as well as the continued resistance to white supremacy, white supremacy and European hegemony. And I, I, I developed this part because I didn't see anything about the anti-apartheid uh, movement in uh, um, uh, Dr. Nantambu's uh, analysis. And that, cause it might be in part because that it's a later development. We didn't get uh, the destruction of apartheid till the, uh, the early 90s. We was well into the uh, uh, late 20th century before we get this, right? South Africa had had a, a particularly arduous struggle. So uh, that's important to acknowledge, all right? And then after, uh, um, you know, apartheid, we get the, the presidency of, of Mandela. And that's, again, that's a critical point to acknowledge. Um, I would argue that hip hop culture itself is a clear example of a continued resistance against European hegemony. Uh, the idea of the Afrocentric paradigm that was developed in the uh, in in the Euro, uh, of the, of the American African American intelligentsia here in the late '80s and, and the early '90s. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Malefi Asante, for instance, Dr. Marlana Karanga, uh, a number of these thinkers. Um, that we, we will uh, talk about uh, further, um, but this is starting to develop as well in, in this fifth period. And then in uh, further, you know, into the 21st century, we got development of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have uh, NSARS in, in Africa, in, in Nigeria to be uh, specific. Uh, we have the movement for reparations. And then we have the continued development of uh, Black art. And uh, I'm thinking about the movies that's come out the last few uh, years, the Black Panther movie, for instance, uh, some of Jordan Peele's work that, that works uh, hard to put Africa and African people at the center of our discussion, of our, of our perspective uh, of the world. And this is what I, what I term as uh, the fifth uh, period of Pan-African development. Um, so, um, Cultural Pan-Africanism, uh, uh, Natambu argues that cultural Pan-African nationalism or individuals whose work are, is focused on development of negritude, the African personality, and cultural trolls, tools for liberation, the challenge of exposing existing oppressive Eurocentric social norms and status quo, uh, it seeks to return and relocate African people to their original cultural heritage. Now, this relocation, it doesn't have to be physical. Right, so if you don't have to physically go back to Africa to be African, it's it's a a, a sense of who you are, right? Uh, Malcolm X, Malcolm X used to say that if I if I have a cat and that cat bears kittens in an oven, I don't call them biscuits, right? They're still cats. So just as African people are born outside of Africa, they're still African people and they're still culturally African people. So we, we move through the world in this same fashion. Um, he argues that what is needed now is for African people to go through the process of Afrocentrification or the global 
of the Afrocentric global re-education using African standard curriculum so that we will thus be able to cure ourselves of the daily disease of Afrocirrhosis, that a uh, miseducation, Eurocentric analysis, and the Urugu virus have, inf uh, have inflicted upon us. And the Urugu is a, in the, um, according to uh, uh, author and intellectual, uh, African-centered intellectual, Marimba Ani, Urugu is the incomplete and destructive uh, of being rejected by the creator. And this comes out of the uh, Dogon, the Dogon philosophy of Mali. All right. Now there are some analytical problems that I, I just, for uh, the into, uh, intellectual purposes, I just needed to highlight in order that we, we talk about these things. That uh, an African identity is a modern expression, right? And it might not translate well in the ancient world. So we have ancient Kemet. Um, they understand themselves, you know, as Kemetic people, but if we were to bring that idea, the idea of Pan-Africanism to them in the past, it might, it might not make sense. It might make sense after we tell them the history, but it might not translate well into their understanding. So to make the argument that um, the early, uh, early Kemetic people were working towards a sense of African identity, it might not translate well. Yes, they made sure that their 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 information and their, their knowledge was was kept, and they they made sure that people knew who they were. But it, what we understand now, the importance of of who they are now, it might not translate uh, well. And uh, uh, prior to the modern era, most African people would identify themselves by their nation name or their tribe, and that this collective Pan African. Uh, uh, understanding uh, m again might not translate well, and again, this is a con this is a consequence of our interaction with Europeans, right? We've had to we've had to pull ourselves in in order to survive, right? I hope that makes sense. We've had to to regroup ourselves and understand ourselves as a collective of people in order to fight against what's we're, what we're moving against. So these are consequences of the modern era. Um, to move further, uh, this uh, the works of, uh, in reading of the um, of Natambu's work, he uh, works to create separation using nomenclature. So I uh, he de delineates Pan African nationalism from Pan Africanism or any other type of nomenclature, and I, I think that um, that is just it, it was problematic in that he needed to work towards um, bringing the ideas together rather than set himself, setting himself apart. And that's just, you know, my intellectual uh, take on, on, his, uh, on his ideas. It's like he, he worked to car he carve his own ideas out, but rather than trying to kind of bring it all, bring it all in. And, and lastly, uh, Africa is not a monolith. Who is African translates differently based on cultural context. So to provide an example, uh, in South Africa, there are hard lines between who is black, who is colored, and who is white, right? These, these, lines, are, these lines are very hard and it's, they're rigid. But in the US, if you have one drop of black blood, you're black, right? That's just the way it works for us. It's because that's how we were treated, right? It doesn't matter if you, it was, you had uh, you know, two white grandparents if you if one of those if one of those black uh, grandparents were black, you were black, regardless of how light skinned you might be, right? Regardless of how fair or 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 straight your hair might be, because that's that's our context. So a per, a black person from South uh, from America who was light skinned like myself would go to South Africa and be considered colored, right? So we have to consider these things as we move forward, you know, trying to bring a billion people together. Again, I started out this uh, conversation talking about the daunting task that it is, that Pan-Africanism is. And these are the things that we have to deal with, right? We have to deal with our understanding of, of culture, of, of context, and, and how we are to be in this world together, all right? And we have to be respectful of others, of our, our, our respective histories, right? 
our history in the United States is a bit different from that of the, you know, South Africa, different from those in Ghana. But we find, if we find the commonality, that common kernel, that common kernel of our, of our culture, we can, we can move, move forward with that in very productive ways. And- um, Oh, this is the link. Yeah, that's, oh, that that's it. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. That's the bibliography for the text. Uh, you know, just take a look at that and that's it. I, I think, just so you know, someone um, raised their hands. One of the students, uh, Mr. Carlo's hand is raised. So, Carlo, do you mind turning on your video so we could, um, we can hear your question? Mr. Carlo, is he, there you go. You are, you are mute. Mute. Unmute yourself, please. You have to, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Okay. okay. Are you hearing me okay. now? Yes. 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 Uh, I have done a, uh, yes, uh, although the article came a little bit, a little bit late to me yesterday, we are due to time differences. Yeah. So I have to rush my readings. So yeah. without uh, making uh, a proper a proper note, but uh, at a glance, I can see that uh, they are categorized with uh, Eurocentric in the sub Sahara and the Trans-Sahara and uh, other things they call there. But uh, what uh, I'm most concerned about is the Pan-African movement of the nationalism. So I was very much interested in the movement of the nationalists because uh, they have a very strong mind because uh, their mind was uh, the kind we don't have in this our generation because uh, the kind of mind they have then that is better that they die. I don't think any of us have it now because we are afraid of so many things. We, we, are, we, we want to protect our life, we want to protect our family, we want to protect our wealth. So we don't have that kind of mind. But uh, the only question I want to raise is uh, how the whole thing started in, uh, in, in Kamet. Because uh, I can see Kamet is a, a Trans-Saharan, where it's uh, mostly dependent uh, on the Sahara deserts, which uh, make up Arabians. So I'm trying to bring out here that uh, uh, it's a very bit, a little bit uh, complicated because uh, most of us uh, down in the West Africa uh, we we see ourselves uh, a little bit uh, quite let me say skeptic from the Arabians, although I don't see African origin migrating from uh, uh, originating from the Arabian. The, uh, origin. Uh, I'm trying to see another another kind of question there too, which uh, the 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 pharaoh then, what his name Ade, uh, uh, was uh, able to join the two knights. So uh, his his effort was quite recommendable. So uh, I see some to have a sum of this movement. Although AU in Africa now is pushing forward to that, which some of the countries are becoming members of which Nigeria became a member just last week of this month. And uh, although the effectiveness is coming up by January 1st of 2021, we are still hoping to know how this movement will go about. Uh, thank you. Let me just say that uh, we have officially ended the Ubuntu dialogue, but we're going to remain on here for a little while for people who have questions. Um, so perhaps, um, uh, Dr. Isterling, you can go ahead and address uh, the question. I think the first one I heard is about the fact, you know, the fact that um, you know, when he thinks of Kemet or Egypt today, he thinks um, of uh, Arab, right? right? People from, from the Arab. Uh -huh. so, so he's trying to figure out okay, how how are they Africans when they are when they are how is Kemet African essentially? All right. So 
the uh, the um, yeah, it, Egypt presently, yes, is Arab. So when we speak about Kemet, ancient Kemet, we're speaking about four thousand years ago. All right, and this was well before uh, Arabia or, or is Islam was a thing. It was, it was well before that. All right, so the movement of African people. Um, uh, develop along uh, the Nile Valley. So when we talk about the Nile Valley, we are talking about Kemet, but we're also talking about a large 4,000 mile area. And within that area, uh, black people, as they have symbolized themselves on the walls and in the in the architecture, they, they symbolize themselves as black people, not as Arabian, right? This, this notion of a lighter skinned uh, 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 people coming from uh, Egypt is a product of the 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 invasion by the Greeks uh, and the invasion by the um, by the Romans. All right, so this is something that happened on the tail end of of Egypt, the tail end of Kemet. We're talking about um, what 500 uh, the, around the year 500 300 uh, BCE. All right. And and when I was speaking about uh, ancient Kemet, I'm thinking of, I'm speaking 2600 BCE, right? So 2,000 years, 2,000 years before we get, 2,000 years before we get to the Greeks and the Romans and the invasions, uh, we have African peoples building ancient Kemet, and the uh, uh, the Arab invasion of this area did not happen well into the common era. So we're speaking about uh, 500 CE, about 1500 years ago, right? And again, the long view, we got the long view of what Pan-Africanism is. So it's two, we're speaking about uh, Egypt four, four, uh, 4,500 years ago, four millennia, over four millennia ago. And that's why we have to have this long view, right? We don't see uh, let me show you. We don't, let we me don't see something. I'm not interrupting you. Say it again. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Yes. Let me let me uh, clarify the whole thing more better because uh, artists uh, categories here uh, he categorized the intellectuals and the the the. Uh, geopoliticals and uh, the other group of people he was mentioning. Uh, what uh, I'm most interested in uh, is the scientific uh, Pan-Africanism because uh, these are the people that are bringing up this light to the whole Africa because uh, I believe they should keep on this light shining uh, so that uh, they will not hide it from anyone. Yeah. So each and every one of us can see the 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 yes the brightness of this light from right. the scientific pan Africanism. Right. And, and to further uh, speak on this uh, um, development in the pan Africanism in the modern age, uh, you said that you didn't believe that uh, people in the modern age have the same fight as as we did uh, decades ago, and I would have to push against that statement. Again, to uh, to uh, my last slide, that we see a lot of development right now uh, in the African world. Again, the black the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is connecting all over the world. It is centered in the United States, but it's also uh, being observed in other countries. And SARS movement in uh, Nigeria as well has gained a lot of interest here in the United States. And again, the uh, the uh, uh, intellectual development. Uh, of Af the Afrocentric paradigm, uh, the artistic development of, of hip hop culture, which is again centered in the United States, but it's spread all over all over the planet. Uh, these are essentially, I will argue, these are essentially African intellectual and artistic movements that are working to keep people informed and and, and grounded in their cultural in their cultural beingness. We have any more questions? I know we're uh, running over a little bit. There's a questions on the okay, Q and A chat. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me.
Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, he said go ahead. There should be a question. Um, the question in the uh, chat room, Dr. Marachi. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, it's not actually on the chat. I think it's on the not on the Q and A chat. Um, just trying to fish that out. Okay, someone is asking. Um, well. A comment first. As a matter of fact, there is no such, such thing as the Middle East that is invented to pull that region out of Africa. Where is our Middle West, Middle North, Middle South? So I don't know if you want to shed more light on that. <laughs> yeah, um, that um, that is uh, an argument, a worthy argument that I've uh, encountered a number of times. It includes, you know, um, grouping that Arabian Peninsula into the whole of Africa. And um, I, I closely speaking, I don't have any issue with that in particular at all. Um, again, the the, uh, the Arab, uh, the the modern day Muslim. Again, this is uh, something that uh, is um, kind of more uh, recent, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we're speaking about ancient Kemet, uh, and we're speaking, you know, a, a long time ago. And that's also, again, to add that there's still a, a very large black population in Egypt. Yes, it is uh, governmentally run. Uh, politically, the structure is run by uh, Muslims and what we will call, one, one, mm -hmm. what one might call Arabs, but it's still a, a black nation. It is still in Africa, regardless of how hard people have tried to remove it from Africa. And, okay. and it's still African people there. Okay, I, I think there's one question here that I need to ask, and um, it says, just as it is common with some of us Africans, how do we deal with people who do not support the Pan-African movement, though rather die as slaves in the land of their colonial masters? <laughs> how do you deal with those people? Um, hmm. Show and prove. Uh, keep working. You know, do, do what you can uh, to help who you can. If somebody does not want to hear or listen to your perspective, you know, you can't force them. Um, so, you know, let them walk their own journey. Let them walk their own path. And their path may lead back to yours. It may not. And that will be their destiny. But we can't, um, we can't force people. And, and it, it does not help us at all to look down on a person just because they don't agree with us or see our perspective. So just keep moving forward and do, do what you do. Um, and don't let them discourage you. Wow, I think we've just run out of time, but I have pretty much learned a lot today. Um, I haven't, I mean, if, if you had allowed me time to read the books or read the literatures, I wouldn't have gotten all the knowledge that I'm getting from today's meeting. So thank you so very much, Dr. Paul Easterling for having made history so easy to understand uh, and complex things you know very you've just simplified everything thank you so much i also want to appreciate our um, osomis that have joined us today very interesting conversations and i can see that they genuinely read you know the pretext reading so thank you um carlo and ebenezer i think he just got kicked out by network but thank you so much for engaging with the conversation today and you know congratulations to you dr paul easterling for this start. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, and, and uh, all our attendees as well. Thank you for yeah, coming yeah. today for the Ubuntu Global Dialogue. I don't know if there are any, you know, announcements before we wrap up today's event. Yeah, I got, yeah, I have one to, to my class, to those who are enrolled, uh, please review, uh, um, continue to review uh, model, uh, module one, and I will be posting everything you will need for module two uh, uh, by Monday of, of this uh, coming week. So next week we prepare for module two. Uh, module two, I'll send you uh, readings and um, we'll go on uh, further with this discussion. And thank you for those who attended. Okay, Dr. Paul, please, for the benefit of those who are attending and maybe someone just listening to you today have just made up their mind that they want to enroll for the course, how, how can they go about that? If you can just, you know, tell them what to do. Um, it's the collective action course. Uh, you have to go to the Osiri uh, University uh, website um, and, uh, and uh, enroll through there. And it's osiriuniversity.org. 
and you'll be able to enroll through there and as well. You'll be able to, uh, you know, look at all the uh, other courses. We have a lot of dynamic courses out there. So, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Carlo, please. Yeah, I was just um, going to quickly say that as we talk about uh, Pan-Africanism, um, we oftentimes we get like a buzz in, in, uh, in our bodies. We feel excited about connecting. Like last week when uh, uh, Professor Siri McDougall, um, the African-American professor of, uh, of ethnic studies came on here, I remember uh, how he was reflecting upon his time in Ghana uh, with uh, Dr. Paul Easterling and it was, I could tell he was excited and I could see the smile on his face. And, and on one hand, I was happy to, to be able to glean and share that moment with, with, with all of you. But on the other hand, I felt kind of, um, uh, I felt really sad um, that we had a lot of work to do because it seems like a Pan-Africanism is still very superficial. Mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. it's at this point it's all about okay let's go visit Ghana oh we are you know let's put on our clothes <clears throat> and there is no sub is not very substantive and I know yep. we are working towards it yeah and I contrast it with uh, pan Europeanism so to speak and in in that sense they don't even make any noise but they are doing it what do I mean by that hmm. I mean if you have a, a UK passport you are welcome to the U.S. anytime. If you have a German passport, you are welcome to the U.S. anytime. <coughs> they can they travel to these to these European um, countries um, at will, and they are able to conduct business easily and they do trade easily. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, you know what has happened to us. I couldn't help but think that what, what has happened to us is a, is a very uh, terrible thing. Um, that what we are left to celebrate is nothing short of the superficial. And so, um, you know, I think we, we, have, we have work to do. We have to quickly go beyond this superficial celebrations and, and start really thinking about ways we can engage intellectually. Um, engage in, in trade and and in travel and in culture um, because that is what the pan-african or pan europe europeans are doing right and we have and africans are locked out of it okay. let's face it um, so um i think you know that's something we need to think about as we uh, leave this uh, first module of, of your course okay. um, how to begin to concretize things uh, moving forward yeah yeah I, I would agree with that statement uh, again you know just uh, something else i said is that we a number a billion people on this planet and we're spread all over it so there is no reason as to why we cannot start developing ourselves intellectually and in a collective sense a billion people on the continent and throughout the world billion people that's a lot of that's a lot of human potential right there and that that is that is that is what we have to do you know and to not be superficial with it i agree with you 100 percent, dr uh, i mean dr. i mean if you just just think about uh, uh simon simon cowell right for example yeah. uh, from the uk i mean he comes in comes to the u.s and dominates the entertainment industry he has like um it's a great green pass you know i mean it's a beautiful thing to see Right? Um, was it Morgan Pearson? Some uh, is his name. He's a, you know, he's from the UK. Came here, you know, became a CNN host. You know, and the reverse is also the case. Americans go to Europe, and, and so we see we see that working. And and again, know that I have any qualms with it. There's no problem with that with that at, at all. It's just that Africans are locked out from that yep. um, in a very systematic fashion. And we've also learned to do it to ourselves because yeah. we, we as Africans, actually, if you, if you, go, if you look, at, look at it from the travel uh, point of view, we welcome people with American passports, with European passports, more uh, easily than we welcome 
right other africans right, right? you know so Man, so this right. is uh, is a terrible thing like i said uh, that's really happened to us and um you know and now, I, I'm, I'm yeah yes please. if i if i may i mean what you said is also speaks to what the last speaker last week was talking about the change in mindset because even for us as africans with the ECOWAS passport so you have i have a nigerian passport for example and you want to go to west african uh, country doing business is not even easy even with the ECOWAS passport right. and you know this also speaks to the mindset how we treat ourselves how we see ourselves how we want to advance ourselves as a people as a nation as a community and you know sometimes you know speaking about the NSAS and all the things that have been happening in Africa we need to think about this is our problem how do we fix it how do right. we fix this mindset? Right. And I think it really starts with our mentality, to be honest. We can't expect people, other people, to treat us better when we don't even see value in ourselves. Exactly, exactly. You know, there's exactly. a whole lot of travel that we need to go, we know, we need to do as a people. And um, it, it's sad to see that in this day and age, we haven't quite made steps in, I mean, meaningful steps in that direction. Yeah. And that's why um, we, I, I brought that up last week because, I mean, just personally speaking, um, when we, uh, you know, when I did make trips back to Africa, um, you know, the first time it's, you know, it's just like, wow, I'm here. But one of the things I've, I noticed that, that thing with the passport that you brought up, that's one of the first things I noticed when we landed because we just walked through and I looked to my left and I saw this line of, 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 of people waiting to get in. I was like, no, that's, that's I, I felt immediately, I felt it. I was like, oh, man, I can't even escape, you know, a European hegemony when I come back here. I just got reminded of it right there. Walking into the country, I got reminded of, of, of uh, European hegemony. Um, but, it, and, but again, in the, in the UK, it's, it's a different story because they can walk through freely with their passport. But then if you look at the key on the other side, you're all people without the UK passport. Yeah. So again, in Africa, it, it's the flip side. I mean, yeah. it, it's very interesting that right, you brought right. that up as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll have to wrap up about this. Um, I think a professor is saying something about research. Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah, it's the, the other class. Okay, then. The so, uh, I, yeah, so we'll wrap up here. Uh, we have another class on, on research methodology. So, I mean, you, our attendees, you're welcome to also join in if you want to. Um, so, we'll close the session today. I just want to say thank you to everyone who spent time to come in today. It's much appreciated. We love you all and Ubuntu to you all. Ubuntu. Have a good day. Ubuntu. Okay, Mr. Carlos, we see you uh, in, in the other class. <laughs>